If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Greetings, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for being here for this special broadcast on the topic, Seventh-day Adventism. Now, you normally don't hear much about that topic. I know, because uh, I've been around for quite a few years, and I haven't heard much about it myself. And I thought it was about time that uh, if no one else was going to do it, our program would do it. And so we're here in this very special series uh, covering the topic of Seventh-day Adventism. What do they believe? What do they teach? Uh, all the different aspects and ramifications of that particular religion. And to help me expound on this topic, and I think almost in a, uh, in a, in a very scholarly way, is a very special guest from Pennsylvania. He's an author. He's authored the book, which uh, I happen to have a copy right here, called Are Seventh-day Adventists False Prophets? A former insider speaks out, Wallace D. Slattery, author. Uh, this, in my opinion, is one of the best books available right now on the market on uh, the teachings and doctrines of uh, Seventh-day Adventists. And I recommend that you get it at your Christian bookstore or uh, through our ministry or through Wallace's ministry. As you, I will now introduce him and give, you a, give him a chance to give a little background information on himself and his uh, beautiful wife and also his mailing address for his ministry. So Wallace, I want to thank you again for being with us in this series. Uh, you're on camera. Uh, you'd like to say hello to our audience and also give a little background information about yourself. Very happy to be back with you people today. Um, Carol and I were Seventh-day Adventists all our lives until we left a few years ago in 1984. We have done a tremendous amount of research trying to find out the facts about Adventism, what it really is, whether it is even whether it is truly Christian or not. And uh, if you would like to contact us about uh, our book, you can contact us through Stepping Stones Ministry at Box L1124, Langhorn, Pennsylvania, 19047. Oh, very good, well, and uh, Carol, would you like to say a few words? You were on last week, and uh, there were some new viewers this week that uh, didn't catch probably show number one. And uh, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Well, I'm happy to be here, and I'm also from an Adventist family. I grew up in an Adventist family. Mm -hmm. I was an Adventist all my life, and not until Wally did some research did we find out that there were problems in the church, and that's why we're here today. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, uh, our viewers out there, hopefully you caught part one of this series. It was uh, highly enlightening uh, if you were able to see it. Uh, uh, Wallace here did an outstanding job getting into the early, hurt, uh, early history of the church and, and a lot of uh, unknown teachings that uh, seem to have been suppressed over the years. I'll keep you in a little suspense on what those things were and hope that uh, you catch a rerun of that or uh, maybe uh, contact our ministries to find out more about th that particular show. But since there is a limited amount of time, uh, we want to cover as much new material as we possibly can in the time we have available to us. So in this particular show, we won't be covering uh, very much of what we covered previously. And we will continue to move into new, uh, new territory as we explore together uh, the uh, vast panorama of Seventh-day Adventism, uh, its prophet and uh, their, their doctrines and understandings of Scripture. Uh, well, basically what I'd like to do now is uh, turn it over to Wallace for a moment here. 
uh, to give us just a very brief synopsis, a uh, recap, to kind of bring us back to where we were, where we ended last week, so we can pick up there and move on. Uh, Wallace, we've got these charts we showed last week. This is just for our new viewers, just briefly. We're not going to get into any kind of detail like we did last time. But if you could explain for our viewers here about the spirit of prophecy, the, the people here in, in uh, this uh, picture, and then maybe uh, Hiram Edson down here in the Millerite thing. And then we'll, we'll try to get back to where we were from last week. Certainly. This picture is of Ellen White, uh, the founder and, shall we say, the guiding spirit of Seventh-day Adventism with her husband James White, also very prominent in the early movement of Seventh-day Adventism. Adventism rose out of the Millerite movement of the 1830s and 40s in which they thought that Christ was coming in 1844. When Christ did not, uh, they, these early Adventists tried to find another rationale for uh, what it might have happened then, and they decided that Christ had actually entered from a holy place in the heavenly sanctuary, the temple in heaven, to the most holy place. Uh, she was the guiding light, often ca called the spirit of prophecy, normally called the spirit of prophecy by Seventh-day Adventism, until her death in 1915. She's built a quite a remarkably strong and great church, which still exists today and is expanding at an incredibly rapid pace. Uh, it's interesting, when I first started writing my manuscript in 1984, I said that Adventism had over four million members. In uh, 1985 or 1986, when I wrote my preface, I said Adventism boasted over five million members. Today, um, well, I, I believe it's probably over six million. In fact, very well may be over seven million. They're, they're expanding at a rate. If they keep it up by the year 2007, every person on this earth will be a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's hope that extrapolation doesn't work out too well. <laughs> but, uh, Here's an idea of how they are expanding, are, however. I would uh, suspect a lot of that expansion is coming, uh, taking place overseas, perhaps. To a large extent. With Russia now opening its doors to They are having religion. thousands of baptisms in Russia at this time. Uh, we just received a, a paper about this. Right. So that's where I would suspect overseas and other countries other right. than the United States where we're filming this is where, where people this rapid expansion. experienced a great loss and they don't know the facts. That's where the people are joining. Well, we found generally uh, anyone that's watched this series for any length of time knows that uh, one of the great, great advantages of a religious organization or a cult, let's say, uh, particularly a non-Christian cult, is ignorance by mm -hmm. the population. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a false religious cult can take advantage of ignorance and that's how they expand their base. And uh, I guess uh, after, what, 70 years of atheistic communism in Russia, let's say, is that example, uh, with hardly any gospel being preached. There's or, been a great hunger. Right, so uh, you can't ask for much better ignorance, can you? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so a false prophet comes in there and he can sound good as gold. Uh, That's what's when, happening. When no one knows the, the true word. But anyway, with that said, we won't even bother too much with Hiram Edson here. You gave a, you know, a great recap on him last time. I want to move into uh, these distinctive teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this will get us close to back where we were from last program. Uh, last time we were here, uh, we, we had a chart on some of the teachings that uh, they are known for. And uh, just looking at this chart briefly, we've got the, they keep the Sabbath day. Uh, they the the Seventh-day Sabbath. Right, the Seventh-day Sabbath. Uh, uh, point two, they have Old Testament dietary laws and, and they, they uh, espouse vegetarianism. Uh, we got into uh, in quite some detail last week, or last time we did the show, uh, the atonement and the sanctuary doctrine, investigative judgment. We'll get into that probably some more as we move through the, the programs. Uh, you had some fascinating information on Ellen G. White's, the prophetess of Seventh-day Adventists, her ideas of redemption and how to accomplish it. Mind-blowing stuff. Uh, and I think that's about where we were when we, uh, when we ran out of time last time. I have a copy of the, um, one of these statements that I gave last time about the lack of a mediator uh, yes. in the last days. Would you like me to put yeah, that why don't up? Yeah, why don't you uh, put that up and then we'll just continue on with the, sh you know, the series now from, from this point. To a Christian and even to a Seventh-day Adventist or to most Seventh-day Adventists, this statement is an absolute shocker. Now, this is from Great Controversy. Uh, I'm not sure which one is the four, page 425 or this, what is the other one there, 625? 614. 614. But let's take a look at this because it is something else. Uh, Trying to locate my the source. Here. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above 
are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Yeah. In other words, without Christ is no longer mediating for you. Their robes must be spotless, their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent efforts, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. And then it gets on into the investigative judgment. Yeah, it talks like about that. the investigative judgment and so on. I might add that both my wife and I, as youth, were taught that in the last days we must stand before God without a mediator. This is still taught to Seventh-day Adventists. See, this nullifies the cruci uh, crucifixion of Christ. The uh, blood atonement of Christ right. on the cross mm -hmm. at Calvary. And that it really comes down to your, your own works, mm -hmm. your own goodness, uh, without a mediator, without Christ to do it for you, to uh, uh, present your righteousness, you have to present your own righteousness uh, as the uh, final key in opening the door to heaven. Now, my understanding of Christianity, and this is something I have come to into over the last 10, 11 years, is that the essence of Christianity is that there is no salvation without the intercession of Christ, without the atonement of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. If you are standing there, and can stand there on your own without a mediator, what does that do to your concept of Christianity? Where is the Christianity to it? Because the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, wouldn't the Seventh-day Adventist, looking at this stuff, wouldn't he say like, uh, well, yeah, we still believe in Jesus as the intercessor, the mediator, because after all, he had to make it possible for us to get to this point where we're in this investigative judgment or something where now we need to make that last step to get into heaven. But he leaves. But he made, it, he made it possible for us to get to that point. So see, he's still our savior in that sense. But he leaves. Wouldn't they argue something like that? Oh, yes, they would. Of course, the, uh, the Bible says our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. That's right. We can never stand before the sight of God without uh, So Jesus. the minute you get away from the righteousness of Christ, you're damned. That's right. <laughs> so uh, you're, there's not even a hope. There is no, no hope. hope at all. Uh, Ellen White was very pessimistic about people. As she made statements such as not in one in 20 is ready to be saved. Many statements along, along these was lines. Was that more like uh, sour grapes just because a lot of people didn't believe her? Well, sour grapes or not, it had a tremendous effect on people. You may be interested in knowing that her own 15-year-old son who died uh, at that age uh, welcomed death. Uh, I don't know, probably some childhood disease as things were back then. Mm -hmm. But he welcomed death. It is, it, uh, the Adventist scenario has been so gloomy that he was glad to die. And I think huh. that's a tragedy again. There are so many tragedies in Adventism. Mm -hmm. Man. Now, we're talking a lot about Ellen G. White here. I'm sure there's a lot of new viewers that haven't the slightest idea. But I know here on uh, point number five now in this chart that we've been going over, we have something called the divine mission of Ellen G. White. Now, uh, just for new viewers and some other people, uh, what is this divine mission of Ellen G. White? That is one that is very interesting for the simple reason that what the Adventists have given to the public and what they are telling their own people are two very different stories. Well, the Adventists will stand there in front of you and say, well, Ellen White is not an addition to the scriptures. She is uh, not to stand in place of the scriptures. They say they, they know how to punch all the right uh, buttons, so to speak. Mm -hmm. However, to their own people, they, the statements are very clear and explicit that Ellen White is the infallible interpreter. Mm -hmm. Now, that makes her an Adventist pope. Mm -hmm. And I have many statements like this. They seem to be coming out of the woodwork. It seems like in the last few months, or a few weeks even, I've been really working on these statements about uh, Ellen White being the infallible interpreter of the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very difficult to get an Adventist to state one way or another whether it is or not. You just practically have to pin them down by the shoulders to the mat before they will admit one way or the other. They want it both ways. They want it both ways. Okay. But the statements I have are just incredible. I have a number with me. Let me pull some of these out. These are, these are concerning these are, the, the divine mission of Ellen G. White and right. what she has to say. And I know uh, we've got some charts coming up here later in the show that we'll get into quite some detail on that. Okay, here we are. You've got one that, uh, you've got so much documentation. I have so much documentation, that's right. Okay. Here's one. Uh, an official ch uh, church publication recently ridiculed the idea that Ellen White is not canonical, as good as the Bible. 
in addition to the Bible. What publication is that? Uh, this is the E.G. White Estate, Spirit of Prophecy Day Sermon, May 16, 1981. And D.A. Delafield, who is in the White Estate, or has been in the White Estate. Now, for new viewers, what is the White Estate? The White Estate is that organization that keeps and controls the writings of Ellen White. It is um, uh, n very close to a general, uh, a general conference headquarters uh, near Washington, D.C. So now, this is keep all the original Delafield. manuscripts That's and right. papers and things that right. she wrote. This is another leader in uh, the White Estate, D.A. Delafield, stating, get this one, Mrs. White is canonical as far as doctrinal interpretation authority is concerned. Mm. Now, even she's on the same par with the Bible. She's on the same par with the Bible. So if the Bible says it, it's true, and if Ellen G. White says it, it's true. Even the Adventist's statement of uh, fundamental doctrines, this is a Seventh-day Adventist book, states that she is ongoing authority. Now, let me hold that up a little higher. Yes, yeah, I'll there. hold it up so you can see it there. And she's the ongoing authority. She is, the, she is authority, and she is ongoing authority. Okay. Uh, so I have more. They're just all over the place. Now, this is Ron Graybill of the White Estate. Mm -hmm. Mrs. White seems to argue at points that the visions constituted the final court of hermeneutical uh, appeal. In other words, if you had a question on doctrine, her visions were the final court of appeal. Like the Supreme Court. If That's you want right. it settled, she'll settle it for you. That's right. I have others. Listen, well, I had the one here. This is Robert Olson, secretary of the White Estate. Mrs. White's, now he says Mrs. White's writings are non-canonical, but have the same authority as the messages of ancient prophets whose literary productions did not become part of the scriptures. That's a pretty high one. And if you think this is just something that might have happened in years past, because I have many other statements like this in my book, mm -hmm. including some, uh, that the, the, she is the court of last resort, statements from the 1970s. This is a, an Adventist Review article that came out in 1991, just a year ago, almost exactly a year ago. Listen to this. This, uh, this is written by Gary Patterson, assistant to the president, North American Division of the Seventh-day Adventists. The ministry of Ellen White, whose writings have become a de facto sacred text for the Seventh-day Adventist community. He goes on to state sacred that, sacred text, and y you know we as Protestants have always said sola scriptura, right? The Bible only for as far, far as doctrinal right. this sort of thing. The Adventists, and it is mentioned in here, they teach prima scriptura. Prima. Uh, the the scriptures are primary, but we have to include these other things. Mm -hmm. I have one more statement here. They are a sacred text of the Seventh Day Adventist Church because the peel of truth in her works has made her so among our people. Huh. Now, these, this is only a year well, that old. that sounds like uh, she's got a pretty good divine mission for their organization. Oh, yes. Well, she has many statements. Um, there were people who said, well, her letters, because so many times there were real faults that came out in her letters, mistakes made. Right. They said, well, those are just her opinions. And she wrote statements that not one idea or one line has, in my uh, writings, has come from anything but God. Actually, a lot of it was copied yeah. from others, and we mentioned that last right. time, and we'll mention it again. Yes. Uh, some of the very statements she used to show that uh, she had, uh, that it had come straight, straight from God, actually were copied from other divine writers of the period. Right. Now, now, this kind of ties in with this next point here about prophecy. Now, what is that uh, she was called uh, in our opening of the show, we, we call her the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy. Now, incidentally, yeah. Adventism has even backed off from that. Uh, it's interesting. As we used to say up in Nebraska, you chase her down one prairie dog hole and she pops up another. Right. But um, it seems like, uh, well, uh, I have a statement from an Adventist leader that she is not the spirit of prophecy. And that is going to stun many Adventists because she has always been called by Adventism the spirit of prophecy. But he says, no, she's not. He says, I believe she had the, um, the, the gift of prophecy, but she is not the spirit of prophecy. In other words, he's saying Adventism is wrong when it calls her that. I got a question here. Why, you know, just looking at this, an average Joe, let's say, I, why do people believe she's a prophet? Why? Well, this I mean, is why, Are you just brainwashed <laughs> growing up as a kid? Are, you know, there's so many people that say they're prophets. Why do these people, who I'd assume are intelligent, good people, they just, you know, 
they're out there, they got a mind and everything. Why do they suddenly say Ellen G. White's a prophetess and not, let's say, Reverend Moon, who claims to be a messenger of God? Why Would you address that? Well, first of all, she claimed. Right, but so do all these promise. other guys. There are certain tests that she that she has supposedly passed. Oh, uh, so in the minds of Seventh Day Adventists. Well, she passed uh, the test of. See, what are some of the tests? Well, supposedly she led a good life. <laughs> well, that's dependent on what you find out in research. That, <laughs> I, I would say so. Yeah, but let's um, see. They also say that she taught, you know, speaks to the law and to the prophets, and therefore, you know. Okay, now y'all were both Seventh Day Adventists mm -hmm. for what? How many years were you Seventh Day Adventists? I was from four, from birth until forty-four, and so you were a Seventh Day Adventist for forty-four years. Right. Carol, how many years were you at Seventh Day? Adventist? Same amount of years. Same amount. Forty-four. So I've got eighty-eight years of Seventh Day Adventists sitting <laughs> no, here. With no, me. she's younger than I am, so it isn't oh, quite that many. Well, years. I mean, I'm just putting the, the years of the Seventh Day Adventists, uh, but. Uh, now, putting yourself back in that mindset before you learned all these new things, what convinced you personally? Was it just because you were raised that way? Uh, was that how you just accepted her well, as a prophet? Well, first you were told what to believe. So and then, they, then the people convincing you would, would say that uh, she agreed with the Bible. Uh -huh. That and was so, one thing. so you just basically, because you, you're a kid, you're growing up, you accept what yeah. your parents say. Right. Yeah. I'm just fascinated, uh, you know, how people follow, you know, they just get this idea that this person's a, a true prophet of God. And uh, since y'all have got experience, I figured that'd be kind of an interesting question yeah. to ask. Then you were told that she held a Bible up, a 40-pound Bible. She held mm -hmm. it up. So you're given a lot of stories. A lot of stories. Which, as it turns out, in reality, are nothing more than that. Just stories that right. really weren't true. But you're accepting basically almost a lot of fables, sort of like the, the Greek did way back there with Zeus. You know, he thought mm -hmm. Zeus was up on a mountain. And it just comes down to a lot of almost like blind faith. Mm -hmm. Not based on any real facts. It's just, you know, you're taking this leap of faith and you just want to believe it because you want to believe it. What they do with uh, the uh, new convert is Ellen White really isn't mentioned to the new convert. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is after you join the organization, then they will present you with certain proof texts, certain things she said that do correspond with the Bible. And once you accept those, then you are expected to believe that she is a prophetess of God, mm -hmm. and you're going to accept her as such without question from then on. That's the way it's presented there. Uh, in other words, you don't know about the controversial parts of it. Right, right. So, they, they, of course, they would be crazy to... Uh, it's like the Mormon missionary. He's not going to come up to your door and tell you, oh, I, I believe Jesus is the spirit brother of the devil, and I'm going to be a god just like all Mormons are going to be gods. There's millions of gods. You know, he doesn't tell you that. He, right. he tells you things that almost anybody could accept at first. And after they get you baptized and get you into their organization, then they start feeding you these more controversial doctrines that mm -hmm. it'll be easier for you to swallow them. But if you try to come on with them right up front, they might get the door slammed in their face. And when you're in church, you're just really bombarded with, with statements uh, that she's made in uh -huh. sermons. You hear about her. So it's just... it's just. Um, now, that's, that's an interesting question right there. When you're sitting in the pew... Are the ser what's a sermon in a Seventh-day Adventist church like? Do they spend a lot of time on Jesus, or do you hear a lot about what Sister White says, or what's the breakdown? Uh, what's the percentage? Do you get a lot of Ellen G. White in a sermon in a Seventh-day Adventist church? It depends, again, on the minister. Now, in California, with the right-wing pastor, the uh, very perfectionistic pastor I mentioned previously, mm -hmm. basically the sermons were Ellen White sermons. Mm -hmm. with lots and lots of sanctification. Brethren, we, we need to do this. Brethren, we need to do that, and so on. Mm -hmm. With some miracles, of course, thrown in. Uh, now, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, the pastor we had was comparatively gospel-oriented as far as Adventist pastors go, and it was, we used to laugh about this. <coughs> the first three-fourths of the sermon would be a beautiful gospel sermon with good, straight gospel. Mm -hmm. But the last 15 minutes, the pastor would be very careful to throw in all the howevers. And these would be all the Ellen White quotes and so forth that basically negated everything the man had said up to that point. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the man knew the gospel, but at the same time, he knew enough to take care of his own job. Oh, uh, I see. So just to keep his own job, he has to compromise the gospel. Oh, yes, he did. <laughs> uh, amazing thing. So uh, 
getting back to our chart then, uh, that was just some fascinating questions. Mm -hmm. I kind of spurred in my mind there as we were talking. That, uh, we've got these other doctrines. Uh, you, you got pro did you have anything more you want to say in prophecy, or should we go on to the soul sleep? Thing? I would like to mention some things about prophecy that I think are very relevant, and that is that Adventism is very strongly opposed to what it calls apostate Protestantism, which basically means all the other Protestant organizations. Oh, as but well they as do accept Roman Catholicism. Oh, no. And they're very strongly opposed to Roman Catholicism, although many of its doctrines are rather similar, or some of its doctrines are quite similar to uh, uh, Catholicism, as opposed to the Pro uh, Protestantism it so strongly opposes. And they also like to make a big thing of spiritualism. Uh, their scenario for the last days are that Protestantism, Catholicism, and spiritualism will join hands and will rule the world. At that time, these combined organizations, and by the way, with the uh, great uh, physical help of the United States, which is also going to be running the world. At this time, uh, they will unite in forcing a Sunday law upon the world, uh, forcing everybody to, not merely to abstain from work on Sunday, but to worship on Sunday. Well, it's sort of like a, a universal blue law. Sort of, a uni <laughs> but much more so. It'll be a law forcing everybody to worship on that day, not okay. merely not buying cars. You know, or this sort of sounds like something Ellen G. White, White might have said. It's exactly what she said. And there's, at that it's time, almost like she's closes. the brain, and any kind of strange thing you hear coming out of the Seventh-day Adventists, it almost can be traced back to what Ellen G. White said. It does. Somewhere Incidentally, down much of this, however, came from the theological suppositions of uh, some of the other leaders. She copied their theological suppositions as coming from her visions, and that has been documented. Mm -hmm. So, uh, she so it's not really all hers, although right. she makes it sound as if it is. Right. Uh, in those last days, then, there will be great persecution of what is left of Seventh-day Adventism. Uh -huh. Toward the end, uh, God will announce through the he heavens the day and hour of his coming. That's shades of William Miller's date setting right. again. They just can't seem to swallow that Matthew That's 24 right. passage. No, they no have their problems the with it. And then <laughs> Christ will come, the wicked will be destroyed, and so on. I, I could go on. There's much more. To well, does this is tie in with this little mini point I had on here under Soul Sleep about the remnant church? Is that... What is this yes. remnant church? Is that tie-in like they're the... the they own? consider themselves the remnant church. And That's everybody right. else is in this apostate, apostate Babylon, yeah. Babylon type... Uh, right. The remnant church will be the only one that goes through. So this is more of... This is almost like a cultic type doctrine of exclusivism. It's very paranoid. The idea is that uh, your neighbors and friends are going to be chasing you around the hills in the future trying to kill you. And so... Uh, is this something they still believe today? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So... So when they're smiling at us and talking with us, and when we see some of their apologists on some TV shows right. trying to say, well, we're Christians just like you are, uh, but they have this belief that really, that they think these Christians who they're fellowshipping with and, and talking with, they're going to hell or they're, they're, well, they're Babylon or they're... Very close. What's going to happen is either these people are going to, quote, straighten out, unquote, about the Sabbath, and become good Seventh-day Adventists, or of course they're going to be part of the permanently lost group that is chasing them over the hills, trying to uh, kill them. Now, now is this, you have mentioned before in the other show we did about a right wing and a left wing. Does the left wing believe this? Yes, they do. They believe this remnant idea? Oh, yes. So, uh, the left wing, they're basically, they're, well, they're Seventh-day Adventists, it's That's just right. that they're not as fanatical as, say, or radical as There as are two the separations right of the right wing versus the left wing. The first is on the gospel, and I don't know that we've had a chance to get into that. The It'll left be wing, coming up later. The left wing does believe pretty much as we do about the justification by faith. They do think that sanctification does include such things as vegetarianism, uh, keeping the Sabbath, things of this sort. The right wing is, simply believes that upon accepting of Christ, we are saved to that point, and then we with Christ's help, work out our salvation from that time, trying to become perfect toward the end there. Mm. So we do have the gospel as one. And the other, of course, is the, um, uh, the role of Ellen White. Mm -hmm. um, the right wing actually uses her materials more than they do use the Bible. In fact, they, will, they have baldly stated that they believe in some respects that Ellen White's writings are superior to the Bible. They believe we have the original documentation 
uh, we have her original autographs and that it is more easy to understand because it was written by a modern day woman instead of like the Bible. More contemporary. So that's the advantage that you've got right. all these advantages to Ellen G. White as opposed to this Bible which was written a long time ago. The left wing tends to be more ambivalent about Ellen White. I would say that maybe there's even embarrassment about her. They recognize that there's a lot of shortcomings and many problems with Ellen White. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, at times it almost seems like they'd like her to go away. Now, now you're mentioning all this stuff about uh, the remnant church and, and all this terrible stuff. But I want to just use this moment here. I want to show this to our people at home. We got a, I've got a little tract here that's been, ma or a little mail out thing actually. It says, Armageddon now. Time is running out for planet Earth. You owe it to yourself to attend this astounding Revelation seminar. And uh, basically, this thing here, it, it has a picture of a, a you know, a, a time piece, a, the sands running out in the hourglass, and you open it up, and there's all these pictures of different apocalyptic type things that are going to happen in the book of Revelation and stuff. And Does the name Seventh-day Adventist appear on it anywhere? Uh, I really haven't noticed. I'll uh, guarantee it, it says Seminars Unlimited. It right. says Coming out of it Keene, does Texas. It does? And, well, that's and, uh, For many years they didn't. It says, oh, it says here, Georgetown Adventist Church Revelation Seminar. Well, that's an improvement. I'm and happy so to see they, that they're a little more open about it. So they are changing some things, but uh, I, I just thought we'd take a moment here with this, this in hand and that people are able to see one of these mail-outs and that these are going on all the time, these so-called Revelation Seminars. Mm -hmm. Could you just kind of briefly tell for a minute, uh, viewers at home, if they were ever fascinated by something they might see, because these are pretty slick advertising pieces. They got four color ads here. I've seen full page ads in newspapers and, yes. and other things. They, they put some real money into this thing. Yes, they do. What can a, an average guy out there, he's fascinated by this, oh, prophecy, end time, revelation. Mm -hmm. uh, what is he really going to get from a, a revelation seminar? This is interesting. Uh, what usually happens is that uh, they will start off with studies of some of the old prophecies, Daniel 2 with, you know, the, uh, the four kingdoms, including the Roman Empire, followed by the divided Europe, etc. So there will be a number of prophecies they'll go through. Then they start getting into the law. They love the law. They'll, they'll talk about the, the, uh, how the, they believe the Ten Commandments are still binding upon humanity. Mm -hmm. Then they get into the Sabbath, the need to keep the Sabbath. Then they'll get into the dietary rules we talked about up you know, here. That's everything on our chart. Right. Uh, I guess they wouldn't get into Ellen G. White too much since no, they, usually, it's the first contact with them. In fact, I have talked to Seventh-day Adventists who never had her presented to them before becoming Seventh-day Adventists, converted mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventists. It's just a strategy of not that's right. bringing her on until after they get you in. On the other hand, I have seen uh, talks given on uh, Ellen White and how they believe she is the spirit of prophecy and so on. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to go either way. Okay. So, uh, so basically, are they going to get a good, sound, uh, a biblical exposition of the book of Revelation on end-time prophecy? Oh, well, they'll certainly get a good, sound exposition on the Seventh-day Adventist view of the book of Revelation. <laughs> <Daniel>. <laughs> okay. Right. Mm -hmm. They are very apocalyptic in their viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Right. And from what I understand, they, they uh, really, in their interpretation of Revelation, they, uh, they have something called historicism, basically applying like the French Revolution to a passage of Revelation. Something That's a good something question. Like you know, I'd like to ask that right now of, our, of, of a Seventh-day Adventist. The Adventist literature is full of discussion on the French Revolution. That's fine. But where is the discussion on the great communist revolution that makes the French Revolution look like an anthill? There is <laughs> That's none. That's true. That's true. And, that uh, is all a 19th century apocalyptic uh, schema. Right, right. And I've noticed uh, from my studies in the Jehovah's Witnesses that uh, Charles Taz Russell, the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, he uh, came up with a, his own exposition of the book of Revelation. And a lot of what he has in his book uh, kind of ties in with the same kind of uh, Adventist view of Revelation where he's, he's saying, well, this verse is the French Revolution. And this verse means some historical event over here. And Russell this came out of the early Adventist movement. Well, so the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Adventists have common ties at their beginnings. Yes. Something that I don't believe the Seventh-day Adventists are very enthusiastic in, about. In fact, uh, speaking of that, there is almost a, a, a tie between a lot of these uh, American pseudo-Christian 
groups or cults, you might want to say, in that you've got the uh, restoration movement back around the early 1800s with Alexander and Thomas Campbell. They started something called a Church of Christ and the Disciples of Christ, Christian Church, stuff like that. Out of that group came uh, Sidney Rigdon, who was in the Church of Christ with Alexander Campbell. He got with Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. They put together the Book of Mormons and so forth. Out of that, uh, they, a lot of these guys start getting mixed up with the Millerite movement. And, and from there, the Adventists, from there, Charles Taz Russell, the Christadelphians with Dr. Moore. Uh, and it gets to be a pretty fascinating thing as you, you look at all these groups and how the Seventh-day Adventists are tied right in with all these early 18th century, or 1800s, uh, early 19th century, uh, American uh, religious movements going on. They were part of what's called the Burnt Over District, which is uh, from, shall we say, Pennsylvania on through New York, on up into New England, where again and again and again they had uh, uh, religious revivals. Right. And it just left the country, as they called it, burnt over, just totally burned out in religion by the time <laughs> they were done with all these. I see, because it, it was really going hot and heavy, I'll tell right. you that much. Well, we're about ready to go on to our next chart practically here. We've gone through, you know, we had the soul sleep, uh, remnant church. Uh, there are some uh, things about where Ellen G. White had said, said something about the sinful nature of Christ, and we'll get into that maybe in, later on in the show, uh, somewhere in there. And there was one other question. I, I put it on a chart just to remind myself because I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, Seventh Day Adventists, like most churches, they they have something like the Lord's Supper, the communion service. Oh, yes. Is there anything? Uh, of course. I think I know what it is, but uh, is there anything that's distinctive about a Seventh-day Adventist communion service that maybe a lot of other churches wouldn't, wouldn't practice? Well, I'm not really sure what you're aiming at. Uh, I can tell you two things that might seem a little unique. One is that the wine is uh, grapefruit, is grape juice. Okay. And okay, that goes back the, to that dietary stuff. Right. The other, and I'm not sure is that it, uh, there is a foot washing involved. Is that what you're... That's what I was pointing yeah. at. I was looking for the foot washing because uh, uh, I'm kind of wondering where in the Bible does it say to wash your feet to take the Lord's Supper? You know, it's kind of a, an interesting distinctive uh, on, on a common sacrament. It was, mm -hmm. I, th I just thought that was kind of an interesting uh, viewpoint that uh, they can yeah. take the Lord's Supper. When you look at the passages... You know the Lord's the the, the Lord's Supper. I mean, uh, the foot washing is mentioned in John 13, but that's uh, completely different from where you find the passages about the Lord's Supper. And it, it's kind of interesting how unrelated passages of text are <laughs> are put together in, in, in a common sacrament. So uh, it, it makes you think. Well, if this can happen on this, can it happen on other other doctrines and teachings? You know. Is well, as you can true? imagine, the foot washing does lead to some very interesting uh, situations, and perhaps we'd better not get into that. <laughs> right. <laughs> very very fascinating. But uh, from what I've understood from another Seventh Day Adventist I talked to, a former one, he he said uh, it actually kind of kills a lot of the participation in the communion service and that a lot of people don't like to participate in foot washing. So a lot of people correct. will stay home that day. Yeah, so they just don't even bother to come to church mm -hmm. so that it can avoid foot washing. So actually mm -hmm. this doctrine added on actually takes away from what's supposed to be a, a, a joyful time mm -hmm. with the Lord. It, I always felt it was demeaning, but uh, maybe that was... Yeah, it was just, I just thought it was kind of interesting. It's something you don't see too often. You know. There's, I think the primitive Baptists get into foot washing and stuff, but that just was one of those I've heard the story points. of the mill workers that all wore blue socks in the time they had a surprise foot washing, and they took their socks off, and here were this long line of blue feet. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> well, I guess with that, what we want to do is, is move on to some interesting questions. Or we're, of course, we're tying this whole series into a, a question we ask in, a, in part one, is there were certain questions you can ask to determine whether a religious organization is a cult or not, a, a cult grouped around someone's interpretation of the Bible. <laughs> And once they do that, then they go beyond what the Bible clearly teaches on cardinal Christian doctrines. And we're trying to ascertain if Seventh-day Adventists uh, fall into that category. And uh, with that said, I've got a chart here asking the question, Ellen G. White, God's prophet? And uh, basically I have some quotes here from Ellen G. White uh, with references and page numbers and so forth. And uh, Wallace, I'd like you to 
kind of read. I'm sure you've seen this before. It's probably even in your book oh, somewhere. Sure. But uh, I'd like you to go through a couple of these, and I think we've got some more on the ensuing charts. But uh, let's let's give the viewers an idea of how important L and G White is as, as far as being seen as a, as God's prophet. Well, uh, you can see this first statement, God was speaking through clay in these letters which I write in the testimonies I bear. I am presenting that to, to you, that which the Lord has presented to me. I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. They are what God has opened before me in vision, the precious rays of light shining from the throne. Even parts of that were copied. You're kidding. That's right. Really? Yes. <laughs> you mean she couldn't even say this without That's stealing right. something from That's somebody right. else? They've had their big problems about her copying. Um, they used to say, well, you know, here we have this amazing thing, this girl who only went through third grade. Remember how I mentioned that she was injured when she was right. a, a small child. Then later on they said, well, you know, she was, and they used this as evidence. I mean, here are these marvelous things being written, and yet, you know, we have this girl with a third grade education. Then Sounds like the Mormons. They always tell me Joseph Smith only had a fourth grade education. Oh, okay. It had to be from God that he wrote this Book of Mormon and all Very this good. kind of stuff. Later on, they began saying, well, maybe she had a little better education than we uh, thought she had previously. Then later on, they said, well, um, maybe she uh, saw some things and unconsciously copied them and not even knowing that. She had a photographic had mind, them. they said. The, finally, they came to, well, she had an unconscious photographic mind. She would read things photograph them in her mind, and later on, unconsciously write them out. Now, there's a very interesting statement written by her own husband about the copying, and there were tremendous amounts of copying. Uh, the Adventist leadership has admitted, um, well, I have one statement by the Adventist leadership in which they admit that over 50% of the great controversy was copied. That's uh, a book? That's, that's the, her major her book, her major book, The Great Controversy, which tells about the history, of Adventism leading on up through these great apocalyptic events I told you about. Investigative judgment. Right, the investigative all judgment, all these things. Uh, her husband, James, wrote a very good uh, statement about this. Let me pull it out here. Okay. And James uh, White, that's her husband. That's right. And he had uh, some things to say about the... Uh, okay, here we are. This is uh, James White writing. Does unbelief suggest that what she writes in her personal testimonies has been learned from others? We inquire, what time has she had to learn all these facts? And who for a moment can regard her as a Christian woman if she gives her ear to gossip, then writes it out as a vision from God? And where is the person of superior natural and acquired abilities who could listen to the description of one, two, or three thousand cases all differing and then write them out without getting confused, laying the whole work liable to a thousand contradictions. Listen to this. If Mrs. White has gathered the facts from a human mind in a single case, she has in thousands of cases. And God has not shown her these things which she has written in these personal testimonies. I'm going to give you one more statement. In her published works, there are many things set forth which cannot be found in other books. And yet they are so clear and beautiful that the unprejudiced mind grasps them as truth. If commentators and theological workers generally had seen these gems of thought which strike the mind so forcibly, and had they been brought out in print, all the ministers in the land could have read them. These men gather thoughts from books, and as Mrs. White has written and spoken a hundred things as truthful as they are beautiful and harmonious, which cannot be found in the writings of others. They are new to the most intelligent readers and hearers. And if they're not to be found in print and are not brought out in sermons from the pulpit, where did Mrs. White find them? From what source has she received the new and rich thoughts which are to be found in her writings and oral addresses? She could not have learned them from books, from the fact they do not contain such thoughts. Certainly she did not learn them from those ministers who had not thought of them. Now, the interesting thing is, and this is horrifying to the Adventist believer, every condition that James White laid down here that would make her a false prophet, every one of them Ellen White has met. Everyone. Got the documented right. facts? That's right. On, it's on all documented. Case. That's right. So he, her own husband would condemn her through his words there. Inadvertently, but he a, did. Right. As a false prophet. That's right. Well, that's fascinating. Well, let's go on here with uh, this chart. I'll go ahead and read this one real quick, move on to the next. 
Um, this is Ellen G. White still talking here. She says, when I send you a testimony of warning and reproof, many of you declare it to be merely the opinion of Sister White. You have thereby insulted the Spirit of God. So anytime anyone would say, oh, it's just your opinion. She, she says, no. <laughs> you know, it's like right. you're, you're slapping God in the face here. You know, you better, you better not take it as my opinion. It's coming from God. Mrs. White had an interesting thing happen in the early 1900s. I'd like to share it with you okay. because it's very interesting. There were Adventist leaders who were saying, you know, we've got real, really serious problems with what you're saying and your claims. We don't know for sure that you are really truly a prophet of God. So she said, and she wrote out a testimony, supposedly straight from an angel, saying, God has directed me that if any of you have questions, write them out and I will answer them. And she sent this out to these people. They thought that's very fair. So they wrote out their questions. They wrote out, a, as I remember, about a dozen questions about various things that had come up. She took these questions. A few weeks later, she sent out another testimony. The angel of the Lord came to me in a vision in the night and said, don't answer these questions. God changed his mind. Whoa, you have the document? document? Yes, I do. I don't, uh, now, that'd be a hard for some people to believe. I don't think I it have it right, right here, but I have it, and I can produce it to you in a little bit. Oh, man, that's, that's incredible. I mean, it, that's right in the... I have it. Oh, you've got it? Yes, I just thought of it. Oh, okay. Hold on. What is this? Uh, what, that's an, this is a very interesting called? little article. Okay. okay, the first was a testimony. Um, would you like me to read it to you? I have the whole thing, or should I just give you? It's, it's again, the um, people involved in the medical work, and she talks about Dr. Kellogg, that's J.H. Kellogg, the brother of W.K. who started Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Yes. Uh, Elders Jones, Tenney, Taylor, etc. I was directed by the Lord to request them and any others who have perplexities, etc., to specify what their objections and criticisms are. The Lord will help me to answer these objections, make plain that which seems to be intricate. Let those who are troubled now place upon paper a statement of the difficulties, etc. Let it all be written and submitted. Okay. Now, the uh, physicians from Battle Creek sent written replies to the above letter in compliance with the divine instructions, stating their numerous and well-founded perplexities concerning her testimonies. But Mrs. White refused to answer their questions on the basis of this later revelation. Sabbath night a week ago, after I had been prayerfully studying over these things, I had a vision in which I was speaking before a large company where many questions were asked concerning my work and writings. I was directed by a messenger from heaven not to take up the burden of picking up and answering all the sayings and doubts that are being put into many minds. God changed his mind. God changed his mind. Could you hold that up for one more moment here to the camera? I'd like to, people to see a picture of Ellen White in her old age. <laughs> I'll, just put it, I'll just put it on the thing here. That's, uh, that's probably when she was in her 80s already, something like that. I would, I would assume so, yes. Yeah, she mm -hmm. lived to be... I think I read some Seventh-day Adventist publication where she was over 70, 70 years in public ministry. I think that's correct. She was 87 yeah, when she like passed that. away. There she is. And uh, uh, never, uh, never recanted never. On anything she said or wrote. It's interesting. Her son, Willie White, years later, said, Mother was directed by God to find various things and, uh, that she thought were good and to insert them in her writings, bring them out, various truths. Mm -hmm. Yet when she told me about these, these, she told me not to tell others that she had been doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In other words, deceit was being uh, uh, practiced uh, from the beginning. She knew it all along. She knew what she was doing, mm -hmm. and she continued it right up to the last. Incredible. Incidentally, some of the last books came out after uh, months and even a year after she had passed away, and basically, um, and. The White Estate has not even bothered to argue with this. Walter Ray has demonstrated that they were compilations of put together by others under her like secretaries, supervision. Uh, other staff secretaries, people, something like that. Right. Huh. But but pushed off as her stuff. But pushed off as straight as visions straight, straight from heaven. Mm -hmm. yeah, amazing. Well, to go on back to the chart then and kind of keep rolling along here. What we have, I just got a few more quotes here just to back up what uh, what's being said here. Here's a. Uh, Here's uh, another statement. Those who are reproved by the Spirit of God should not rise up against the humble instrument. It is God and not an erring mortal who has spoken to save them from ruin. 
Testimony for the Church, Volume 3, page 257. That's Ellen G. White uh, saying, don't rise up against me, a humble servant <laughs> or instrument. Uh, not, you know, don't look at me. You know, this, is coming, this is God that's talking to you here. And basically down here, and I think we've seen this before, this is coming from the Advent Review and Herald from October 4th, 1928. Now, the Advent Review and Herald, is that an official... Yes, uh, magazine is. of the Seventh Day Adventist yes, Church. Yes, it is. Uh, many of the documents I've brought out came straight from what is today called the Adventist Review. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this goes back to October 4, 1928. You say Seventh Day Adventists hold that Ellen G. White performed the work of a true prophet during the 70 years of her public ministry. That's what I was just talking about. As Samuel was a prophet, as Jeremiah was a prophet, as John the Baptist, so we believe that Mrs. White was a prophet to the Church of Christ today. Here's another statement. This is a fairly recent one from the Adventist Review. Today, the Bible only is the cry of some who seek to discredit Mrs. White and undermine the authority of her writing. On the surface, this slogan sounds logical and appealing, but when analyzed carefully, it is seen to be invalid. And it goes on that we, uh, well, comparing her to the writings of Luther and so forth. The problem is, of course, that Ellen White was considered to be an infallible interpreter of the Bible. And in 1971, the Adventist Review re describes her as the only infallible commentator on the Bible and the final court of appeal among God's people. Mm -hmm. Now, this takes us back to the last thing I have on this chart about testing the prophet. She's right. obviously, they're, they're elevating her to the status of a biblical prophet uh, with full authority, canonical, all the rest of it. And uh, we mentioned this on the last show in passing, and now we'll mention again here the Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22 passage right out of the Bible where the, the Word of God tells you how, you how do you test somebody that claims to be a prophet of God. And uh, just reading from the text here out of Deuteronomy 18, starting at verse 20, it says, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Okay, there's the text. How, how are we going to know if this person is a true prophet? Verse 22. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him, or as you mentioned before, uh, don't, even, don't really respect him at all. Adventism has a major problem with that, and the reason is, that you see, if Adventism describes Ellen White as the infallible interpreter of the Bible, mm -hmm. that means basically that the Bible is being interpreted by Ellen White. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, that the Bible is being tested by Ellen White. Mm -hmm. Because no matter what you read from the Bible, you take her interpretation and that's the only interpretation that there is. It is circular reasoning. How can you test Ellen White by the right Bible when everything she says is correct? That's true. It's true. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how she interpreted this passage that we just read. <laughs> I wonder what she would say. Well, it's not brought by the, out by the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, I assure you. Right, right. So, uh, so far in these two hours that we've done on this particular program, this series we're doing on Seventh-day Adventism, uh, we haven't even started, really. It's we're just coming up in the up. Right. In the next show, we'll be getting into some real meat on uh, looking at Ellen G. White's uh, teachings, prophecies, other things. We're going to really get into this thing and, and bring this Matthew, I mean Deuteronomy 18 passage to play. But I think uh, Wallace has already said plenty of things already to <laughs> kind of shake the foundations, I think, of, uh, uh, of this uh, prophetess, Ellen G. White. Uh, now, if y'all would like more information on this, we're, we're running out of time in this particular program, uh, but uh, please call or write our ministry. The numbers will come up on your screen at the end of the program. Uh, uh, we've had phone numbers popping up from time to time on the screen. Uh, you can write Wallace here personally. I'm sure you, a you answer uh, per personal correspondence as oh, well. Oh, yes, I do. People uh, might have specific questions they may want to call to your attention and see what you have to say about a, a certain subject. In fact, uh, why, don't take this to say. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you take this moment to give your address again for those that might be interested in, the, in this topic? It's Stepping Stones Ministry at Box L1124, Langhorn, Pennsylvania, L-A-N-G-H-O-R-N-E, 19047. I'd like to say something to the Seventh-day Adventist believer who might be following. That is, my wife and I, we love you as a believer. If we didn't love Seventh-day Adventists, we would have major problems with members of my family because 
they are still devout Seventh-day Adventists. But we do, what we're saying is aimed at the organization and against leaders who know what they are describing and that so many of these things have been hidden from the people. Uh, the gospel of Jesus is a simple and beautiful thing. It doesn't need to be hidden and obfuscated with many complicated and complex uh, interpretations. It seems like Adventist leaders are constantly explaining Bible verses that they really don't mean what they claim they do. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Uh, I want to thank our viewers for watching once again. Uh, this is part two of uh, our series. We'll be continuing again next time, next week, this time on this channel. So please join us. Uh, I'm Larry Wessels, your host. And if you'd like some literature, other information we have available, particularly from uh, the Research and Education Foundation, of which I'm a, a staff member, uh, feel free to call or write. We'll be glad, more than happy to send you any kind of information on this particular topic that uh, you, you may require. Uh, we're trying to be uh, open and upfront. We're not trying to espouse any hate towards anybody. Uh, the key here is truth, biblical truth. Uh, if we really hated Seventh-day Adventism, I, I doubt that, or Adventists, I doubt we'd even bother doing these shows. Cause right. Let them just Wouldn't believe care. what they want to believe, and if they end up in hell, that's their own problem. You know? but, but we love you, and uh, we want to make that point clear. Well, God bless you. Thank you uh, for joining us, and tune in again next time. God bless. Bye-bye. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 